Holy God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come before you and open your word. That as we open your word, God, I pray that they wouldn't just be words on a page that we read and understand. But God, I pray that they would come alive for us through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. That we might actually live them this week. That we might be your people and show the world around us that that's true by the way we love them and by the works that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're beginning a series on purpose. Yes, we're beginning the series on purpose, but the series is called Purpose as well. So we're going to look and walk our way through the book of Ephesians together. It's a letter that Paul wrote to encourage a young church. As he looked at this young church, he thought, you know, that they were following, and he says, I praise you for following Jesus Christ, but he wants to encourage them to go even farther. Some would argue that this is one of Paul's most theologically oriented books in terms of the way he looks at the church and how the church is going to live out their faith and understanding of who Jesus is. And so as we look at it together, we want to look at it from that light. And each week you'll be encouraged through the reading plan in your bulletin to read through the book of Ephesians, uh, the part that we're both looking at, and um, to continue to, to move through the whole of the book. As I looked at and read the chap first chapter of Ephesians, it reminded me of when I was a kid. When I was probably six or seven years old, my dad was a manager at a high-end retail store that started in Michigan but grew to Florida. They had 11 stores in Florida. The store or company was called Jacobson's. And uh, if you've been in other areas of Florida, you might know it. Uh, they didn't have a store in Ocala, unfortunately. But when I was little, the children's department would sometimes put on special events to have families come in and see the new clothes and hopefully buy the new clothes, right? And one of the things they did was a little fashion show, and they brought a magician in. I remember being six years old and watching this magician, who probably was just a normal dude Monday through Friday, but on Saturday he was the magician at Jacobson's. And he had this whole act that he did, and he, he pulled out all kinds of different tricks, ones that I don't even remember and some that I do. And as I watched it, I just remember I probably had my mouth hanging open just in awe of how did he do that? Like the mystery of how did he make that disappear or how did he make that up here? How did he cut that or appear to cut it and then it was whole? Like how did he do all of those tricks? There was this mystery to it. And I was so intrigued by it that I asked for a magic set for that Christmas. And I, lo and behold, Santa gave me a magic set. Um, it happened to have been sold at Jacobson's, which most of my gifts were. But I got this magic set, and I started learning some of the tricks. And I will tell you, a little bit of the shine of the mystery wore off once you started knowing what the magician had been doing for certain tricks. But over the years, I have been just continued to be a little intrigued by magicians because of what they do and how they do it, and there's a mystery to it. We don't know exactly how they do everything. There's even some channels on YouTube and probably TikTok and places I don't go very often on social media where the, I've seen the magician say, I'm going to show you how this trick is done, and then they fool you again because you're like, cool, I want to see how that's done, and then they don't really show you how it's done which I think is cruel and torturous. <laughs> I wonder this morning if there's any sort of feel for you about your faith having a little mystery to it. That when you read the Gospels or read through Scripture, that there's this mystery that you get it, you're reading the words and you, you understand it at some level, but then behind it there's like a mystery to it. I've been a Christian now for 38 years. And yes, there's some here today that that makes me old. There's some here today that that makes me young. And I'm grateful for all of that. But in my faith over the past 38 years, and still to this day, there is a mystery that comes with following Jesus. There are some things in life that we just don't still understand. It seems like daily, maybe weekly is a better way, but 
it seems like there's lots of things in life that I still don't understand. As a matter of fact, when it comes to things of faith, there's a lot of things that I still don't understand, and I have degrees in this stuff. I just still, there's a mystery to it, and there will be until we meet Jesus face to face. And yet, in the midst of all that mystery, there's purpose. There is clarity in what God calls us to be and to do. And so, we want to look both at the mystery today and the clarity. We want to look at what we look at and go, "Mm, I don't know that I get that yet. But also look at the things where Jesus was very clear with us. There's still that major dose of mystery. In your life, maybe it's just life. (laughs) Day to day has some mystery to it. Maybe it's your marriage. Um, If you've been married more than a day, there's mystery in that relationship. Amen? Maybe it's raising kids, because there is a mystery to that. When the girls were younger, more so than today, there would be really great days, and then there would be days where you're like, how did we get into this mess? And yes, we knew how we did, but it's still hard. There's still a mystery to it. Maybe it's your career, that there's still pieces of it that you still are learning no matter how long you've done it. There's mystery in life. In faith, maybe it's creation. We all look at creation, and that's pretty amazing. Like, how did that really, really happen? And lots of people have spent thousands of years trying to figure that out, and yet there's still a mystery to it. Perhaps it's the Trinity. Have you figured that out? If you have, let's meet for breakfast or lunch, and let's talk about it. I want to know. There's a mystery to the Trinity. The resurrection. There is a mystery to the resurrection, so much so that many, many people have tried to explain it away. And yet, we have to walk in to the mystery. And of course, as people of faith, there's a mystery to Jesus' return. We don't know quite how it will happen or when it will happen, and if someone says they do, please run the other direction. Because Jesus himself said, it's not for me even to know, and it's not for you to know, surely, when the time and place is going to be. I sum up my eschatology or end time theory of Jesus' return in two words. Be ready. Because that's what Jesus said. Be ready. Be right with God. Be following Jesus and love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Just be ready. And so when it comes to all of these things of faith, Paul is charged as an apostle with encouraging new believers. They have accepted who Jesus is. They're beginning to meet together in home churches, and they're they're beginning to form those types of realities and, and go over what it means to follow Jesus, and yet there's this huge dose of mystery for them. He reminds them what it means to be chosen and to follow Jesus because of that choice, to be adopted as sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. And he encourages them that through, G- excuse me, through Jesus, they are redeemed and forgiven. He reminds them that the good news is a mystery to the world around us. If you tell someone that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you look them in the eyes and mean it in today's world still they will think you're a little bit off your rocker. They will, because it's still a mystery. And he reminds them that it's their responsibility and privilege to share this mystery of God's will with the world around them. And so what does he say to them? Let's take a look at that. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10 together. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So the blessings come in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will 
to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This is a reading from God's word. We pray that it would bless us and that we would understand it. Here's my big idea today. I believe that the purpose of God's will is revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, I know what you're thinking. You went to seminary for that, Tim? Yes, I did. (laughs) Because here's the deal. When I say the purpose of God's will is revealed in Jesus Christ, you probably learned that in Sunday school in one way, shape, or form. You're probably still learning it as you read through Scripture, but how are we living it out? To me, that's the mystery. We have the purpose given to us, but how do we live out that purpose in our everyday life? And so we're going to look at that today. today. Excuse me. The more we know Jesus, the more we should want to share Jesus with others. The more we know about Jesus, the more we should want to share Jesus with others to help that revealed purpose be revealed to the rest of the world. And to most of us, that is a part of the mystery. How do I do that? Well, here's the good news, a part of it today. The good news is that you are God's plan A. You're God's plan A for accomplishing His purpose in the world. We just read, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. God chose us. And he didn't choose us so that we'd feel special, although we are, because he chose us. Out of all the people in the world, he chose you and he chose me. To be the ones who will help his plan, his purpose, be spread throughout the world. We're God's plan A. And here's another important piece of that. There is no plan B. God didn't develop a backup plan. We're it. We're the ones who get to share God's purpose. And when we rely on someone else to share the good news, we're letting God down in terms of what God created us to be and to do. We are the one who have the pleasure of sharing God's will and purpose. And how do we do that? Through our story. Each one of us has a story. As I'm getting to know you, this is the second week, so I've still got a lot of room to get to know each of you, but I'm hearing bits and pieces of your story. I've heard about marriages. I've heard about being confirmed and or baptized in the church. I've heard about a lot of parts of the story, and our story is what God puts in us to reveal his purpose. I've been using the John chapter 9 method of sharing my story for a long, long time. So what is that? It's not necessarily a developed thing. I just use John chapter 9 as the the template. In John chapter 9, there was a man who was born blind at birth. And he'd been that way all of his life. And then the man meets Jesus one day. And Jesus is kind of tested, like he always was, by the people around him, especially the religious leaders. And so Jesus kind of gross, but spits on the ground, forms a little clay out of the dirt, puts it on the man's eyes, and tells him to go wash the clay or the mud off. And when he does, he goes and does what Jesus told him to do, and when he does, he can see. He's healed. And so to me, the Matthew 9 version is just, oh, and he goes and everybody's like, aren't you that guy who couldn't see? He's like, I am. They don't believe it because he now can see. And and every time they ask him, he's just saying, I met this guy named Jesus. I was blind, and now I can see. And so to me, here's kind of the way I work it. I share the condition that we were in, or I was in, which can be called sin. 
I was in sin. I, I didn't know any better at the time. I really didn't, but I, I was in sin. I was apart from God, and I needed a Savior. I met this guy named Jesus. I've mentioned it last week. It was on the third row on the right-hand side at, in a pew at Trinity United Methodist Church in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. I met this guy named Jesus and experienced salvation, justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then every day since has been different. I, I wasn't blind and could see, but I was lost and was found. And Jesus made a profound difference in my life. And so if you just use those three steps, that begins to help people understand that God's purpose can be for them too. Because I was lost in sin, whatever your story is, however it played out, I met this guy named Jesus and experienced salvation like I never thought I could. I experienced love in a way that I never thought I could. And now every day since has been on the road to what John Wesley called sanctification. That God is continuing to work in me. And yes, it's real. Because we are God's plan A. The second part of what Paul is telling this church at Ephesus is that God's purpose is revealed to them or to us. God's purpose is revealed to us. It's not just that Jesus comes and saves us, but there's a purpose behind it. Paul wrote, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. And so, yes, we need to do a little bit of work and go back to Jesus and look at what Jesus taught his disciples because Jesus basically said to one of the folks who asked him, he said, if you want to know how to sum up all of what I'm teaching you, it's love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And this is all revealed to us, to you and to me. And that's how important we are in the plan. We are God's plan A. God revealed the mystery of God's purpose in Jesus, that Jesus was born in human form or incarnate, that he was raised by human parents, trained by human leaders, walked, talked, taught as a human, and a living, breathing, skin-on example of what it looked like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. If we remember those things, we remember God's purpose. And remember, we are plan A to reveal that to the world around us. Jesus loved us so much and loved the world so much that he submitted to the worst treatment imaginable in the hands of humanity. He suffered, was crucified, dead and buried, and on the third day was raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. The mystery of faith is that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. We get to reveal that purpose to the world around us. The last thing is that we also need to remember that God's purpose is to bring unity to all. God's purpose is to bring unity to all. Paul writes to them to say, to be put into effect when times reach their fulfillment, this purpose, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. We sometimes think that the mystery of faith is that God, Jesus, uh, died, was buried, and raised to life so that we can go to heaven. And that's part of it but that's not all of it. God's purpose was to send his son so that everyone might believe in him and that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. That the world would be united under this common cause and purpose. And that's what we reveal as well. To bring unity. And so when I talked about wanting to be a pastor who brings the gift of peace... To Ocala first, I believe that peace is the first step in bringing unity. We want all to know this. We want everyone to know this, that 
we must first fully receive Jesus and fully live for Jesus so that we can then fully make known Jesus to others. There's a mystery to this, but it's revealed to you and to me. First through Jesus, then through us, and the world will hopefully hear all of this and give their life to Jesus, that we might all be united under the same purpose in Jesus' name. Scripture is very clear that Jesus will come again. That Jesus will come back to earth and, and unite everyone under him. And part of our purpose, probably the main purpose of our existence in, as a relationship with Jesus Christ, is to help others to know this and to know the love of Jesus revealed in Jesus himself. Because when Jesus returns, one day... Everyone will have the opportunity to say, yes, I believe that Jesus is who he said he was, and he's my Lord and Savior. And so maybe you've wondered, as you begin reading through the, the book of Ephesians, maybe you've wondered in your own faith life, what is God's plan for my life? What is God's plan for my life? What is my purpose? Maybe that's a different way you've asked it. And here it is today in chapter 1. God's purpose is revealed in Jesus Christ. You are God's plan A to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The purpose is revealed to us, each and every one of us, in Jesus. And that purpose is to bring unity to all. Unity in relation to Jesus. And so how does this change how we approach life? It changes everything. When we know that our purpose is to share our faith, share the good news, share the story of Jesus so that others might know and that it might bring unity to the world around us, it changes everything. When pressed and when we get, feel the urge to share our faith, we have to remember that's our purpose. Because many times we shy away from it, don't we? Many times we just say, not me, Lord. Like, that'll be weird. Or we might even think it will get fired. Or we might just think that the other person will walk away from us and not want to ever be in relationship with us again. But the reality is, God's revealed purpose for us is that we are his plan in spreading the good news of the gospel. And that we can do it. It's as simple as saying, here's how I was. I met this person named Jesus, and now here's how the rest of my life has been. And when they start asking you questions, the really great thing about the John 9 method is they can't really detract from it because it's your story. They can't say, well, that didn't happen because then they're calling you a liar. It's your story. And so just share your story about how this good news has affected you. That's the beginning of your purpose in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you for revealing to us your purpose in Jesus Christ. And we look forward to going through the rest of what the Apostle Paul has to say to us about how to live out our faith and to follow you with our whole life on purpose. So God, as we finish in worship today, help us to Keep this in mind as we continue to celebrate you and to glorify you through our time together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.